Well, good afternoon again. You're about to witness the end of a beautiful friendship. <laughs> um, no, actually, I'm not going to make any effort to insult uh, Dale Olquist. Um, he uh, does a very good job himself. <laughs> <laughs> but what I would say is that I, I, Dale and I first started reading Chesterton at about the same time. I, first, I bought my first Chesterton book back in 1980, uh, The Well and the Shallows. And Dale was telling me he read his first Chesterton book, The Everlasting Man, on, on his honeymoon in 1981. Um, so we discovered Chesterton around the same time. We were, we were reminiscing. And I was saying that in those days, you could look around second-hand bookshops in England and pick up all sorts of Chesterton and Belloc books and Morris Baring books for about 20 pence. Um, so the equivalent of 40 cents. And most of my Chesterton and Belloc collection, I'm afraid that unlike Lou and some of these serious collectors, most of mine are 15th edition and they're falling to pieces. Um, because they're the ones I bought for 20 pence and uh, they're the ones I have. And, uh, you know, I really basically bought, I couldn't get enough Chesterton, I wanted to read Chesterton. But times have changed. Because in those days, you could get Chesterton that easily because everybody had, you know, that generation had died off, their children weren't interested. So the, the, the books were just basically dumped on second-hand booksellers and uh, were being sold off very cheaply. No one cared. Chesterton was forgotten, uh, or largely forgotten. And Belloc was largely forgotten. And then you look, you know, moving on 25 years to today and, and the change, and the huge change in that period with uh, the Chesterton Society, the American Chesterton Society, conferences such as this, and a conference such as this would have been, uh, on Chesterton, would have been unthinkable 25 years ago. Uh, so I would like to say, obviously, that Chesterton largely is, uh, is undergoing a revival of interest because of who he is, Chesterton. But I don't think we should ever allow ourselves to forget that the Dal Olquist is one of the major reasons that Chesterton is now widely known because Dal Olquist has emerged as um, a great champion of G.K. Chesterton in many ways. And now virtually all of Chesterton's books are back in print. They were, back in 1980, they were virtually all out of print. You can probably count the number of Chesterton books in print on one hand. So this wonderful revival of which Dale is an integral part. And the other thing I would say is that, that um, Dale is an inspiration to many people including to me, and I wanted to just make one practical example here. Dale came up with the wonderful idea of approaching EWTN at some point about making some television programs about Chesterton. Well, not, not only, thankfully, did they say yes to that, but I think that the format of that show uh, was took EWTN to a new level. Because, quite frankly, as much as I love EWTN, generally speaking, it's a talking head. And that's as far as it gets. And, and, and Dale you know, had a way with that show of bringing in actors and Dale's own, own inimitable style. And that was a very lively show and a very interesting show. Even if I wasn't interested in Chesterton already, that would have been one of my favorite shows in EWTN just because of the liveliness of it. And when I thought of the idea of, of approaching EWTN about dramatizing or, or doing a series on my Shakespeare book, and they said yes, when I was writing the screenplay for that, the TV script for that, um, I wrote to Dale and asked Dale to send me copies of his scripts because I wanted to model my series on his because that's how inspirational it was. So this basically two things are necessary for anybody to be successful in communicating. One is to know what you're talking about and the other is to communicate to others what you know. And you know there are many pro university professors that know they know what they're talking about, but they can't communicate that knowledge. And that doesn't make you a good teacher. I know very few people that know more about G.K. Chesterton than Dale Olquist. And I know nobody that communicates that knowledge about Chesterton better than Dale Olquist. It's an honor to welcome Dale Olquist. Okay, Joseph, I take back all the bad things I said about you. <laughs> but you'll never be allowed to introduce me again. <laughs> we, 
We've heard from the experts today. <laughs> that comes to a crashing halt right now. You could, if, if, if I am an expert, uh, and I have been called an expert on G.K. Chesterton, and since, since Chesterton wrote about everything, that would make me an expert on everything, which means I wouldn't be an expert then, right? Uh, it was 100 years ago this month, September of 1908, that Chesterton published three books. He was almost as prolific as Joseph Pierce. <laughs> book called Varied Types and a book called All Things Considered, one of his most popular collections of essays, and a, a third book, Orthodoxy. We are celebrating the centennial of Orthodoxy this year. How many have read the book? <coughs> Liars. <laughs> <laughs> There's three problems with reading orthodoxy. I've said this before. The first problem is you read through the book, you underline the whole thing. <laughs> you get to the end and you say, well, what was that about anyway? <laughs> it's like the, the lady who went to, uh, to Hamlet and when she walked out, she said, you know, it's nothing but quotations. <laughs> because there are all these great quotations that make you stop and think and get out your pen and underline, you, you just lose the whole thread of the argument. The second problem is that when you read a sentence, the sentence that comes after it is completely unexpected. It's not the sentence you expect. So every new sentence is a surprise, which causes you to lose the thread of the argument. <laughs> so then you go back and you reread the book. And it's a completely different book. Someone has rewritten it since the last time <laughs> that you read it, which of course causes you to lose the thread of the argument. <laughs> the third problem, or the fourth problem, I said there were three, the fourth problem, <laughs> is that Chesterton himself says there is no thread of an argument in the book. <laughs> he says it's a set of mental pictures rather than a series of deductions. It's not an ecclesiastical treatise, but a slovenly autobiography. Nothing more, he says, than his elephantine adventures in pursuit of the obvious. Yeah, so, so obvious that we read it and we don't know what it's about. We get totally <laughs> lost. Our experience is something like the uh, experience that Chesterton himself describes at the beginning of the book, which is of this guy who gets in the boat, goes off to discover a new land, and gets turned around and comes back and discovers England, thinking that it is the exotic foreign country that he had set off to discover. So he's seeing all the things that he's seen before, but he's seeing them for the first time with a new set of eyes. And that's what Chester does. He is talking about things that we all know about, but we are seeing them for the first time when we read, when we read Orthodoxy. And, and he says, this is the problem that the artist is, is really, every good artist is trying to, to convey how to, in fact, uh, Judge Fury quoted that same line, how can we contrive to feel at once astonished at the world? and yet at home in it. Well, it's a paradox. <laughs> Lou uh, defined paradox for us this morning. The, uh, the truth that goes against our expectations, the surprise. Orthodoxy means the straight truth, and paradox is the truth that goes against our expectations, and that's what the straight truth does. It goes against our expectations. It is something that we think we're familiar with, and it turns out that it's shocking. It's something that is entirely consistent, and yet it seems completely contradictory. And while you can find a paradox on virtually every page of orthodoxy and virtually every page that Chesterton wrote, there's another book 
that is full of paradox, which shows that Chesterton is not alone in using this device. It's a book that a lot of you aren't familiar with because you're Catholic. It's, it's called the Bible. <laughs> The first shall be last, the last shall be first. If you save your life, you'll lose it. If you lay down your life, you'll save it. The greatest among you must be your servant. A virgin shall conceive, the dead shall rise. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. Beware when all men speak well of you. Count it all joy when you meet various trials. Who says there's no humor in the Bible? <laughs> so what I want to do is take us through this book, Orthodoxy, which whose birthday we're celebrating, and take us through it only with the paradoxes in orthodoxy. We're just going to look at the whole book looking only at the paradoxes in it. We've already dealt with the paradox of that first chapter of, of the explorer who gets turned around and has this surprising view of his own land. Chapter 2 is called The Maniac, and the main point of that chapter is that the problem with modern philosophy is that it's not paradoxical. Something that Lou brought out this morning with uh, the, the problem of, of uh, the alternate gospel, the gospel uh, about Apollonius, who was, was not paradoxical enough, and that's why his lordship didn't last. It, and that's the problem with modern philosophy. It doesn't work because it's not paradoxical. It, it, tries to do with the, it tries to do away with the contradictory nature of truth. And when you, when you try to do away with the contradictory nature of truth, it leads to madness. Chesterton says, the madman's not the one who's lost his reason. The madman is the man who's lost everything except his reason. And... He's laying the groundwork for a, a fellow named uh, Pope Benedict XVI, who uh, pointed out that the problem with the Enlightenment was that it tried to do away with faith. And the problem with the Protestant Reformation is that it tried to do away with reason, it tried to rely only on faith. You have to have both faith and reason. And they don't contradict each other, even when they seem to contradict each other. But if you do away with faith, if you do away with that, what Chesterton calls the creative imagination and rely only on reason, he, he, he gives the wonderful image, it leads to a narrow universality, a small and cramped eternity. The madman who relies only on reason locks himself just says Chesterton, in the clean, well-lit room, or the clean, well-lit prison of one idea. The morbid logician seeks to make everything lucid and succeeds in making everything mysterious. The mystic allows one thing to be mysterious and everything else becomes lucid. And this leads us to really the second definition of paradox, which is the idea of two truths that are both true and yet they seem to contradict each other. And Chesterton says the normal person has always accepted this idea. The normal sane person has always seen with two eyes, just like our physical sight is two eyes, and yet because we see with two different eyes, we actually are seeing two different pictures at one time. And we're putting the contradiction of seeing those two images together in our brains, he says, our spiritual sight is also stereoscopic. And that's why the sane man has always believed in fate, but always believed in free will as well. Because they're both true. There's, God is in control, and yet our, our choice makes some difference. We, the, the normal man has always admired youth because it was young 
an age because it was not. And he's, he's seen the two pictures and the contradiction, and he accepts both. But the, the lunatic tries to do away with the contradiction. And as, as uh, Chesterton says, he tries to get the heavens into his head, and his head splits. Because the wonderful comparison of the two images of the circle and the cross. The circle is that cramped infinity, whereas the cross, which has a contradiction at its center, stretches its arms out into all of eternity without altering its shape. It can grow without changing. Then in su the, the chapter 3, The Suicide of Thought, we take things a step further. We learn that any modern system of, of thought is, is incomplete and unbalanced because it's not paradoxical. If you take any of these modern philosophies to their logical conclusion, it, it not only leads to madness, it leads to self-destruction. There, there, he says there's not only a touch of mania, but a touch of suicidal mania. Uh, one of the paradoxes that we encounter in this chapter is the idea of the virtues running wild and the virtues doing war at each other because we, we live under this broken system of ideas. And so the virtues are not connected to a coherent system. It's a, a line from Chesterton that I quote every day. And here it comes. It's coming up right now. <laughs> In a broken system, you have people who care only about truth and people who care only about pity. But the people who care only about truth, their truth is pitiless. And the people who care only about pity, their pity is untruthful. It's a pretty good description of the conservatives and the liberals. <laughs> and the whole point is that we have to have truth and pity, truth and compassion, justice and mercy, they have to go together. You have to have both. Virtue needs to be paradoxical in order to be sane, in order to be virtuous. Another paradox in this, uh, in this chapter is that every act is an act of self-sacrifice. Because when you choose anything, it means you reject everything else. And to admire mere choice is to refuse to decide. And then the other, the other uh, truth that he starts to hint at in this chapter is that true freedom comes only with self-limitation, which leads us to the next chapter, The Ethics of Elfland. And he talks about the poetry of limits versus the boredom of endlessness, and that all freedom is within the rules. Uh, he calls it the doctrine of conditional joy that all virtue is in an if. He brings up the fairy tales as the examples of that. that you, know, you will be happy if you get the carriage home by midnight. You will be happy if you don't eat that apple. And he, he said that he, he learned these great paradoxical truths in the fairy tales in the nursery. And Jack the Giant Killer is about the, the paradox of courage, that unless you're afraid of the thing, you can't be brave. And Cinderella is about the, the paradox of humility, that the, the humble and the lowly will be exalted. And Beauty and the Beast is about the paradox of love that you have to love a thing first and then make it lovable afterwards. He also, uh, he also combines the very liberal interpretation of democracy with the very conservative interpretation of tradition. He says that tradition is merely the democracy of the dead. It means giving a vote to the obscurest of all classes, our ancestors. And then there's this paradox about children, 
that children have this abounding vitality, that they're in spirit, fierce and free. And yet, children always want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again to the adult. And the adult does it again until he's nearly dead. <laughs> For grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. Perhaps God says every morning, do it again to the sun. <laughs> And every evening, do it again to the moon. Then chapter 5, the flag of the world. The main point of this chapter is the paradox that Christian happiness is based on the idea that we really don't belong in this world. He calls it being homesick at home. There's the, the modern philosophy which... Chesterton calls loose and latitudinarian. Latitudinarian, good word. Scott, isn't that a great word, latitudinarian? Great word. Everyone needs to use that word in the next day, okay? <laughs> Find an opportunity to say the word latitudinarian. <laughs> The, lo the loose and latitud latitudinarian philosophy always is trying to assure us that everything is fine, everything's okay, we're right where we, we should be. And Chesterton says the problem with that philosophy is that it's depressing. <laughs> Whereas traditional Christianity tells us <coughs> we're in the wrong place. And this brings us tidings of comfort and joy. It's because the doctrine of the fall is a source of hope, and it's a reason to sing. Now, there's an interesting echo in this chapter from that first chapter about contriving to be at once astonished at the world and yet at home in it, because there's a, there's a little twist here, because we're, there's the feeling that the world is a strange place, even though it's familiar, that our home is not our home, and that there's this longing in us for something better. Chesterton says he started to realize the, this whole paradoxical nature of truth when he first realized that there are these two things. There's Christian tradition, or the church, and there's the world. And the two are not really connected. And he saw that the problem of the world seems to be solved by the answer of the, of the church. But there has to be a way to live in the world, to love the world without becoming worldly. And the paradox of patriotism is this, that we have to hate the world enough to change it, but love it enough to think it worth changing. A couple other paradoxes in this chapter that are very timely. The mere pursuit of health always leads to something unhealthy. <laughs> and that all creation is separation. A woman loses a child even in having a child. And birth is as solemn a parting as death. Then comes chapter 6, which is called the paradoxes of Christianity. There are some paradoxes in this chapter. <laughs> the first one being, of course, that Christianity itself is a surprise. It is something different from everything we are told it is when we start looking at it for the first time by ourselves. It's, it's different from what its opponents claim it is, and it's even uh, it's even the opposite of what they claim for themselves. Uh, Chesterton says he, he felt himself drawn to the, to the Christian faith for the first time because it was attacked from every side. And the attackers all contradicted each other. They found that Christianity was too rational, but also too irrational. That it was too violent, but also too meek. It was too gloomy. It was too bright. 
it uh, em emphasized celibacy. It emphasized having children. <laughs> it, uh, it, 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 seemed to, it seemed to dislike the Jews. It was too Jewish. <laughs> it had too much form. It had too much content. And he says that there must be something special about this thing that, that those who hate it don't mind contradicting themselves and each other in their tripping over each other to attack it. He also uh, saw that the more he considered Christianity, the more that he realized that while it had established rule and order, the chief aim of that order was to give room for good things to run wild. Which I think is the quotation in the program, isn't it? Yes. Clever, clever. <laughs> but the whole idea of keeping the Christian doctrine pure and keeping the balance of ideas in, in perfect sync, keeping perfect justice and perfect uh, mercy, is not only a difficult task, it's a dangerous task. And Chesterton saw the church as a lion tamer. People have fallen into the foolish habit of speaking of orthodoxy as something heavy, humdrum, and safe. There was never anything so perilous or so exciting as orthodoxy. He also saw that it's easy to be a uh, to be a heretic, it's easy to fall into error. The difficult thing is to maintain the truth. Falling into error is as easy as falling down. And there's a thousand different angles, an infinity of angles at which one can fall, but there's only one at which one stands. <laughs> it's an echo of another book that Chesterton wrote also in the year 1908, also 100 years ago, his most famous novel, The Man Who Was Thursday. It was also written the same year and in that uh, novel, you will probably recall, there is a discussion in the first chapter where uh, Lucian Gregory and Gabriel Symer are talking about uh, art and form, and Lucian Gregory is the anarchist and says, you know, why does the train always have to arrive at the station? Wouldn't it be great if it arrived somewhere else? And Gabriel Syme, the poet, says, Hitting the target is really the poetical thing. Missing the target, there's nothing poetical about that. This was a time, imagine, when poets believed in order. Those days are gone. <laughs> Chesterton also points out in this chapter that it's the complexity of Christianity that he found appealing. Not that it's a simple creed, but that it's a difficult one. Because the world has a very complicated set of problems. And it's the complicated set of answers provided by the Christian doctrine that, that answer those, that, that are the solution. It's, he says, if, you, if the key fits the lock, you know it's the, the right key. And the lock is a complicated thing, and a key is a complicated thing. And because it's so complicated, it does make it difficult to explain. It is hard to explain the faith sometimes because it is complicated. Because he says you're convinced that something is true not because something proves it, but because everything proves it. That's when you're convinced. And, and Chesterton says, you know, when you're, sometimes when you're called upon to defend the faith, you don't even know where to begin. But the point is you can begin everywhere. Just like if you were called upon to defend civilization. He says, well, you, know, you start with that chair over there. And, and you start with, with a piece of architecture. You start with, with, with whatever's at hand. As Chesterton says elsewhere, you should be able to defend the faith with any object whatsoever. If you can't defend your faith to a cab driver, you can't defend it to anybody. He says, life is not... Uh, an illogicality, yet it is a trap for logicians. Its exactitude is obvious, but its inexactitude is hidden. But again, it's like that image of the lock and the key. Because, it's, because the, the creed is complicated, it works. And he says, the more complicated the coincidence, the less it can be a coincidence. 
and then in probably the best image, or the best illustration, rather, of paradox in the book, he describes courage as a paradox, because courage means a strong desire to live taking the form of a readiness to die. If a soldier wants to cut himself out of a difficult situation, he has to lay his life on the line in order to save himself. He has to be willing to die in order to, to realize his dream of staying alive. But he also points out charity is a paradox because it means loving people that are unlovable. And what Christianity does is it keeps these the two contradictory ideas together. He says, and we want we want those the two ideas both kept. We want red and white to both be strong without turning into pink, without bleeding into pink. We want the red of the blood of Christ, and the purity of Christ, without without them bleeding into pink. He says, the church has always had a healthy hatred of pink. We want an amalgam. We don't want an amalgam. We don't want a compromise. We want both things at the top of their energy, love and wrath, both burning, which leads us to the ultimate paradox of Christ himself. Fully God and fully man. Not half God and half man like a centaur, or not a thing that's not, not quite something different from God and something different from man like an elf, but both things at once, both things thoroughly, very man and very God. Christ is the ultimate paradox. And we have to believe that he's both human and divine. And we can't resolve that contradiction in our minds but we have to believe them both because that's the only thing that makes sense. That is the mysterious thing that if we allow it, everything else becomes lucid. That's the mystery that explains everything else. All right, there are still three more chapters in the book. <laughs> Chapter seven, the eternal revolution. In order to have something that moves, you have to have something that doesn't move. You can't understand motion unless there's something that's standing still. You can't measure change unless you have something that does not change. You can't have improvement unless you have an ideal. Christianity is a permanent thing. It's a fixed and eternal reference point. And without it, we can't measure anything called human progress. And all of our political and social movements will fail unless they're based on an unchanging ideal. Progress, he says, should mean that we're always changing the world to suit the vision. What progress does mean, unfortunately, is that we're always changing the vision uh, to suit the... We're just always changing the vision, that's what he says. <laughs> so... We, we, we can't really have progress unless we say what we're progressing towards. And you hear, you hear the term progressive all the time. And it doesn't mean anything. You can't be progressive unless you define what your goal is, and then we know whether or not we're progressing towards it. But you can't simply be progressive. And that's the problem, of course, with, with liberalism, is that it always defines itself as progressive, and what always ends up happening is that it attacks the permanent thing. It, it attacks the, the religious ideal because it is itself not based on anything permanent or unchanging. Sometimes based on something vague called humanity, which isn't even human. It always ends up meddling with the most human things, with faith, with the family, and with food. But the main problem with conservatism, Chesterton points out at the same time, is that corruption is a natural occurrence. He says conservatism is based on the idea that if you leave things alone, you leave them as they are. But you do not. If you leave a thing alone, you leave it to a torrent of change. 
If you leave a white post alone, it'll soon be a black post. If you want it to be white, you must always be painting it again. You must always be having a revolution. And his whole idea of revolution, his explanation, which I think was pointed out by, by Judge Fury, <coughs> the American Revolution was trying to restore an order that, that, that once existed, and that order was being lost. The whole idea of a real revolution is to go turn back, to recover the normal. Also in this chapter, he says that hardness is weakness. It's easy to be heavy. It's hard to be light. Satan fell by the force of gravity. And angels fly because they take themselves lightly. In chapter 8, the romance of orthodoxy, he again goes after the, uh, those who, who attack dogma. And they attack dogma because they have a dogma of their own, which they are, are unable to define, but which is materialism. And when the reformer set out to reform uh, theology, they always try to liberalize theology, which uh, achieves exactly the opposite in terms of social effects. Chesterton says the liberal clergyman is always the one who rejects miracles and never the man who's free to believe in them. Almost every contemporary proposal to bring freedom into the church is simply a proposal to bring tyranny into the world. And here's one of those lines in orthodoxy that is just simply lost among all the other great lines, but it's worth looking at. If we want reform, we must adhere to orthodoxy. If we want reform, we must adhere to orthodoxy. That's the key to reforming the church, is being more orthodox. Chesterton says that, points out how uh, those who attack the church, uh, for whatever reason, never are able to destroy the church, but they do end up destroying everything else. Men who begin to fight the church for the sake of freedom and humanity end by flinging away freedom and humanity, if only they may fight the church. The enemies of Christianity do not destroy Christianity. They only destroy everything else. A very good paradox. And then Chesterton compares religions for a while in this chapter. And again, completely the opposite of what we expect. How many times have you heard it said? All religions are basically alike. They're just different in their forms. Chesterton says it's just the opposite. Most all religions have the same basic forms. It's what they believe that's completely different. <laughs> all religions have you know, some form of clergy, usually some holy uh, writings, some form of altars, sworn brotherhoods, special feasts, candles, what have you. They all have same forms. It's what they believe that's completely different. <laughs> Buddhism insists that God is inside leaving man inside himself. And the result, Chesterton says, is isolation and indifference. Christianity insists that God transcends man, leaving man to transcend himself. And the result is wonder and curiosity and action. Pantheism suggests that one thing is as good as another. And so there's no impulse to any moral action at all. Islam rejects the Trinity and has bred the cruel children of the lonely God. For it's not good that God is alone. Traditional Christianity believes in the freedom of both God and man. Calvinism took away the freedom of man, and scientific materialism took away the freedom of God. Other paradoxes in this chapter, the free thinker is the one who's not free to think for himself. He's bound to materialism. Chesterton says, our world would be more silent if it were more strenuous. Now there's a paradox. Our world would be more silent if it were more strenuous. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> you know what it means? It 
means that we shouldn't have loud music in restaurants. That's what it means. <laughs> Which is truly one of the greatest evils visited upon the modern world. And Chesterton backs me up on that. Noise is a sign of laziness, of passivity. Think about that. Here's another one. Sham loves, sham love ends in compromise and a common philosophy. Real love has always ended in bloodshed. This sounds a little strange, doesn't it? <laughs> well, Jesus says, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And he said, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. Chesterton says that Christianity is the only religion where God himself seems to be a rebel. Or how about this? It's the only religion where God himself seemed to be an atheist. Because at that moment of crucifixion, God turned himself, he turned his back on himself and abandoned himself for an instant. Let, let the atheists choose a better God than that one. That's why he says elsewhere, if there were no God, there would be no atheists. <laughs> <laughs> and then the final chapter, authority and the adventurer. I used to puzzle over what the, the title of that chapter meant. I read the book for years, having no idea what, what, the, what the title meant. I'd recommend the book to people, realizing, I don't know what the title of that chapter means. <laughs> but then I, in one of my rereadings, I, I found the answer. It's in there. A man cannot expect any adventures in the land of anarchy, but a man can expect any number of adventures if he goes traveling in the land of authority. Because... It's authority where there are rules. And that's where you, can, you can't have adventures if there are no rules. The great adventure that we are on is our attempt to regain paradise. Because our normal condition is not our normal condition. The prime paradox of our religion, says Chesterton, something that we have never in any full sense known is better than ourselves and even more natural to us than ourselves. That the normal itself is an abnormality. That the thing that does not seem to be true is true. It's a truth, he says, that is fresh like water and comforting like fire. There's a paradox. He compares the Christian truth to fire and water at the same time. And those two things contradict each other. The incarnation may be hard to understand, it may be impossible to understand, says Chesterton, but the moral atmosphere that it creates is complete common sense. And all of the arguments against the incarnation, if we weigh them, are complete nonsense. The common arguments against Christianity are simply false, and they can always be exposed as being false. What is the shocking reason why people believe in miracles? Because there's evidence for them. What is the usual reason why people don't believe in miracles? Because they have a doctrine against them. Chesterton said there was... There are these three surprises that came up that uh, they always heard, these objections to Christianity, which he thought were very good objections. The only problem with those objections is that none of them were true. <laughs> One is that science has proved Christianity to be false, but it hasn't. One was that miracles don't happen, but they do. The other is that the church is dark and cruel and barbaric, but it isn't. And there's a little hint here of, of what he's going to write about uh, a couple decades later when he writes The Everlasting Man. 
He says, once heaven came upon the earth with the power or seal called the image of God, whereby man took command of nature. And once again, when in empire after empire men had been found wanting, heaven came to save mankind in the awful shape of a man. Those are the two parts of the everlasting man right there. The creature called man and the man called Christ. Everything Chesterton writes is all of one <laughs> seamless garment. It's astonishing how consistent he is from the beginning of his writing career to the end. And this, this piece of fabric called, the, uh, called orthodoxy is woven right in to the seamless garment of all of Chesterton's writings. <clears throat> the difference in his conclusion between paganism and Christianity is that the pagans and their modern counterparts were miserable about everything, but jolly about everything else. <laughs> Whereas the Christians were at peace about everything, but at war about everything else. Joy, which is the small publicity of the pagan, is the gigantic secret of the Christian. A secret so gigantic that God kept it secret in the person of Jesus Christ. Chesterton ends the book with a wonderful image that when Christ walked upon the earth, showed us that he was truly human by showing us his emotions. He was never afraid to weep. He was not afraid to get angry. But there was one thing that he apparently kept secret. But maybe it's, maybe it's the thing he did when he got up early in the morning to pray. That one thing he kept secret was his mirth. I thank God that uh, Chesterton didn't keep his mirth secret. God bless you all. Thank you.